Merry Christmas, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about two videos, actually. They're both by Inspiring Philosophy. He's a Christian apologist, as I'm sure most of you know. I've done videos on his stuff before. These videos that we're talking about today are Christmas videos, of course. They are on the subject of Luke's census, the census from chapter 2 of Luke's gospel. And I'd actually like to begin by reading that short passage. Don't worry, it's, it's very short. And I know you guys have already heard it, but... Uh, come on, guys, it's Christmas. We got to get in the Christmas spirit. So, quote, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee uh, to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child." Unquote. So it turns out that historians, some historians at least, have noticed what they perceive to be problems with this text in the Gospel of Luke. And even as far back as the 17th century, these problems have been discussed. You can see here on the slide an example given by N. Clayton Croy from the year 1612, as well as other examples from later years. It has even been suspected, and not proved, but suspected, that maybe some comments in the infancy gospel of James, Tertullian, and Justin Martyr might perhaps betray some perception of problems with the census in Luke. Although, again, I should clarify that this is not proved. It is only something that is suspected. So I'm putting up here on this next slide five points. These are by the German theologian Emil Schurer, who wrote this oh, way back in the 1880s, I think, although this is from the 1973 translation of his History of the Jewish People. I wanted to find a list that I thought would encapsulate these problems, and you can find lists like this in numerous commentaries, but this one appears to have been rather influential. So what I think I'd like to do is to move through these points one by one, and then we'll talk about inspiring philosophy's reaction to them. And I'll give you a spoiler, which is that in my opinion, it's really point number five, which is where the real historical difficulties lie. And this is not to say that points one through four don't deserve to be mentioned. We, we are going to talk about them in some detail, actually, but uh, you'll see what I mean going forward. So let's begin with point number one, quote, history does not otherwise record a general imperial census in the time of Augustus, unquote. Now you might have noticed Luke doesn't say anything about the Roman Empire here, but he does use the term oikemene, and according to the late biblical scholar Joseph A. Fitzmaier, oikemene means inhabited earth, and this way of speaking was often used with hyperbole in the official rhetoric of decrees and inscriptions for the Roman Empire itself. In other words, when Luke says all the world, what he means is Augustus's world, the Roman Empire. The problem is, though, and as Fitzmaier himself points out, aside from this statement here in Luke, and of later Christian and pagan writers who depend on him, there's no ancient evidence of a universal worldwide registration or census ordered by Caesar Augustus. Now, inspiring philosophy's response to this is to say that that's probably not what Luke meant. And actually, I find myself agreeing with inspiring philosophy, and yeah, I know, go figure. Now, in his video, Inspiring Philosophy goes on to cite Harold Honer and William Ramsey for support, but I actually think that A. N. Sherwin White gives a better explanation. Quote, Luke has been misunderstood. A census or taxation assessment of the whole provincial empire, excluding client kingdoms, was certainly accomplished for the first time in history under Augustus. Now, it was the way of Augustus to issue general explanations of the particular actions of the central government. It's likely that Quirinius issued the instructions for the census of Judea with an introductory edict of Augustus, explaining that the census should be completed throughout all the provinces. Unquote. What Sherwin White is saying, and I agree with him here, is that it's easy to imagine some scenario where Augustus sends out a proclamation to Judea saying, hey guys, it's time for the census, we're doing this all over the empire, come on Judea, you gotta be part of this, something along those lines. 
Now, to be clear, it is an imagining. We don't have any corroboration that Augustus sent out some proclamation like this to Judea, uh, but we do have examples of similar proclamations that Augustus sent out, and Sherwin White provides one that you can see here in the slide. So let's go ahead and move on to Schur's second point. Quote, Under a Roman census, Joseph would not have been obliged to travel to Bethlehem, and Mary would not have been required to accompany him there. Unquote. Now, part of this objection to me just doesn't make sense, and that's the part about Mary being required, supposedly, to register with Joseph. But if we read Luke, and here it is on the slide, it only says that Joseph went to be registered with Mary. It doesn't say that she was required to go by Roman law or anything like that. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that in the opinion of Emil Schurer, and remember that Emil Schurer is the guy giving all these objections, in Schurer's opinion, Luke, as he puts it, gives this impression. In other words, Luke gives the impression that Mary was obliged to travel with Joseph for the census. But I have to say, reading the English translation, I didn't get that impression at all. So I thought, well, maybe there's something going on in the original Greek that I just can't see in the English. And so I turned to N. Clayton Croy. He's an expert on Greek. In fact, he wrote a textbook, as you can see here on the slide, on biblical Greek. And in his opinion, it's not clear that the text requires this interpretation. That is to say, Schurer's interpretation. Croy goes on to write, quote, The fact that Mary accompanied him almost seems to be an afterthought. Mary's accompanying Joseph on the journey may thus have been entirely their personal decision, unquote. Now, for me, Croy's response seems entirely satisfactory. In fact, it seems rather obvious. It's not clear to me why Schurer wouldn't have come to the same conclusion that Croy did, but I guess he didn't. But for me, what's really strange is that inspiring philosophy, a Christian apologist of all people, uh, he seems not to have picked up on this, again, in my opinion, obvious objection. Instead, inspiring philosophy seems to tacitly accept this idea that Luke does imply that Mary had to go with Joseph. The response he gives instead is, in my opinion, downright bizarre. He talks about how a man's children are seen as extensions of his own value and significance, and somehow, supposedly, this means that Mary had to be registered in the census along with Joseph. For me, it's not clear at all what the heck he's talking about, but fortunately for him, it just doesn't matter because because as Croy has pointed out, and in my opinion correctly, Luke just doesn't say that in the first place, and so there's nothing that needs to be explained. But the other part of Luke's statement does need to be explained, and that's where he says that all went to their own towns to be registered, and that Joseph in particular went to Bethlehem, quote, because he was descended from the house and family of David, unquote. The problem is, though, and as the New Testament professor John T. Carroll points out, there's just no other evidence that a Roman census would have required registration at the ancestral home rather than the place of current residence. Now, in response to this objection, inspiring philosophy points to a famous edict issued in Egypt in the year 103 or maybe 104 of the Common Era, quote, the house-to-house -house census having begun, it is essential for all those who are absent from their gnomes for whatever reason to be summoned to return to their own hearths so that they may complete the usual business of registration and apply themselves to the cultivation that concerns them, unquote. So, okay, what's going on here? Well, one of the things that I noticed immediately when I read it is that this has nothing to do with ancestral homes. Yes, it is telling people to return to their gnomes, but presumably that's because that's where they lived, not because some ancestor lived there Lord knows how long ago. As N. Clayton Croy writes, quote, Gnomes in the first sentence of the edict refers to the administrative districts into which Egypt was divided. The gnomes in question seem to be especially those surrounding Alexandria. Note also the language, who are absent from their gnomes for whatever reason. This implies that these districts are their normal residences from which they might be separated for any number of reasons, some permissible, some not. For example, performing needed services in the city, escaping the toil of rural life, or dodging tax liabilities." Unquote. Croy goes on to list three other problems with using this piece of evidence as support for Luke's census, and you can see them here in the slide if you'd like to pause the video and look over them. 
So I find myself here agreeing with Croy. It doesn't look like this Egyptian edict is all that helpful in assessing Luke's accuracy or inaccuracy. I am a little bit surprised that Inspiring Philosophy didn't take a different tack, because it may not be that Luke is saying that everybody had to go to their ancestral homes. When he says that they have to go to their own city, he might just mean that they had to go back to wherever they lived, or, and here's the crucial point, wherever they may own property. And this possibility has been floated by a number of biblical scholars, including, as you can see here, Amy Jill Levine and Ben Witherington III. In their opinion, quote, the Roman census counted people where they lived because their taxes were related to where they owned property. It's possible that Joseph owned property in Bethlehem, unquote. The problem for me is that's very speculative, and even just a speculation, it still doesn't completely solve the problem. John T. Carroll points out, quote, even within the narrative, the supposition that each person went to his own city to be registered encounters difficulty, for Joseph and Mary later returned to Nazareth in Galilee as their own city in chapter 2, verse 39, unquote. In my opinion, a far better explanation than that maybe Joseph owned property in Bethlehem is just to appeal to what I would consider to be Luke's obvious apologetic motives here. For Luke, the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem, even though Jesus was apparently from Nazareth. This was the view, for instance, of the late theologian Petra Pocorni, who wrote, quote, Since it was generally known that Jesus grew up in Nazareth, Luke had to get him to Bethlehem and used the census to do so." Unquote. So, okay, let's go ahead and talk about Emil Schurer's third point. Quote, A Roman census could not have been carried out in Palestine during the time of King Herod. Unquote. Okay, so that's a little vague. What is he talking about? So the background here is that at the time of Jesus' birth, Judea was what's called a client kingdom under Herod the Great. It was allied with Rome, but it hadn't been annexed as a province, at least not yet. And so, okay, well, what's a client king? Well, a client king is a modern umbrella term for a host of fluid and informal states of indirect administration. And here I'm quoting Andreas J.M. Kropp. He's an expert on client kingdoms in the Roman Near East. And Kropp goes on to explain, quote, The relationship between king and emperor was fluid, informal, and based on mutual trust. Client kings were nominally independent and probably not liable to tribute, but required to make ad hoc payments on demand and contribute troops to the Roman army. In their own kingdoms, their main task was to maintain peace and stability. As long as these conditions were met, Rome had no reason or inclination to interfere." Unquote. Okay, so what does that matter? Well, Emil Schurer argued that from what we know of client kingdoms, it would have been very unlikely for Augustus to have decreed that a census be done in a client kingdom. As he puts it, quote, from everything known of the position of client kingdoms in relation to the Romans, and particularly of Herod's position, this seems impossible, unquote. Inspiring philosophy's response to this objection is to quote a number of scholars, including, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this, but I'm going to go with it anyway, including a historian named Sabine R. Huebner. And she points out that we do actually have an example of a client kingdom conducting a census in the Roman fashion. She writes, quote, Tacitus makes reference to a Roman census in 36 CE in the kingdom of Archelaus II, the Roman client king of Cilicia. Trachea. The Roman governor of Syria, that was Vitellius at the time, uh, is depicted as having assisted the client king in holding a census on the Roman model in the territory he ruled. This suggests that a similar census on the Roman model could well have taken place in the kingdom of Herod the Great, officially directed by Herod but with military and administrative support from the Roman governor in neighboring Syria." Unquote. Well, that example does seem to be on point, more or less anyway, but it's not perfect. Notice that it wasn't Augustus decreeing that the census be made, but instead it was Archelaus himself giving the census with aid from Rome. And so in N. Clayton Croy's opinion, for instance, he says that, quote, the parallel fails. It was Archelaus II, the client king himself, who imposed this census, apart from any Roman directive. 
Client kings could always exact taxes from their own subjects by whatever methods they wished. The question is whether Rome would intervene in the affairs of a client kingdom in a particularly intrusive way by conducting a registration of persons and property for the purpose of taxation, unquote. So it's definitely not a perfect parallel, but that doesn't mean it's irrelevant. The classicist G. Anthony Ketty points out, for instance, that, quote, this account, that's the account of the Cilicians having their senses taken in Tacitus, uh, this account does not constitute sufficient evidence to consider the Roman facilitation of censuses in client kingdoms to have been the norm. Nonetheless, Roman client kings, including the Herodian rulers, would have imposed their own census practices in their territories and would have called on the Roman military from time to time to help quell resistance, unquote. Well, okay, yeah, uh, but even so, in my opinion, Croy's point is well taken. This all sidesteps the question of whether Augustus would have ordered that a census be taken in Herod's kingdom. And so, yeah, I agree with Croy. But on the other hand, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that much. Again, in my opinion, it seems like an extremely dicey game to try to divine what somebody would or would not have done under any circumstances, including 2,000 years ago. It seems like we just don't have enough information to make a definitive judgment on this. But that historian, Sabine R. Huebner, which we quoted a moment ago, she has an idea about what might have happened. It turns out that around 9 BCE, Herod began to fall out of favor with Augustus. She writes, quote, A rift had opened up between Augustus and Herod in 9 BCE after Herod had mounted a military campaign against the Nabataeans. This had been discussed beforehand with the governor Saturninus, but Herod had neglected to secure the approval of Augustus as well. Augustus then broke their political friendship after more than 20 years and threatened to treat Herod as a subject rather than as a friend and ally from that point onwards." Unquote. So in other words, in Huebner's opinion, this might have, as she puts it, motivated Augustus to order a Roman census in Herod's kingdom to assess the tax-raising potential of the region, recalculate the tribute due, and put Herod firmly in his place. Of course, as should be obvious, this is speculation. It's educated speculation, but still speculation. Croy writes in response to this idea that, quote, It's not clear that Augustus followed through on this threat. That's the threat to treat Herod as a subject rather than a friend. It's not clear that Augustus followed through on this threat, apart from refusing an embassy from Herod shortly thereafter. Josephus certainly makes no mention of the imposition of a Roman census and taxation in the aftermath, unquote. And well, wouldn't you know, that's just a perfect segue into Schurer's fourth objection. Quote, Josephus knows nothing of a Roman census in Palestine during the reign of Herod. He refers rather to the census of A.D. 6 or 7 as something new and unprecedented. Unquote. In other words, when Josephus is talking about the census of A.D. 6 or 7, he never comes right out and says, hey, this is the first census, the first Roman census in that area. But he does seem to give that impression, at least in the opinion of some interpreters like Emil Schur. Now, inspiring philosophy actually doesn't tackle this objection, so it's strange that he left it out. But I know how I would respond, which is that this is an argument from silence, and arguments from silence are notoriously unreliable. Historians know this, but they sometimes use arguments from silence anyway, including in this situation. And N. Clayton Croy is no exception. He also gives this very same argument. So let's see what he has to say. Quote, While this is admittedly an argument from silence, it has some force for three reasons. First, Josephus's coverage of the reign of Herod is quite tailed. Second, a Roman census would almost certainly have stirred up vigorous opposition, so Josephus would have had to omit reporting both the census and the reaction to it. And third, the way Josephus speaks of the census in 6 CE implies that it was unprecedented." Unquote. 
So those are all fair points. I'm not sure that they are entirely convincing. Josephus is known to, on occasion, leave stuff out of his account. In fact, the late Donald McKinnon took the time to give a few examples, which you can see here on the slide. The idea that there was a revolt attached to the census of 6 CE that Josephus mentions, that's a little bit of a stronger point, but even it is not decisive. It turns out that we have an example of a sequence of two Roman censuses where the first census didn't cause rebellion, but the second one did. Sabine Huebner points out, quote, In Gaul, it had not been the first provincial census under Augustus in 27 BCE that had led to rebellion, but the second one in 12 BCE presumably because the local population were aware the second time around that the primary purpose of the census was the collection of tax revenue, unquote. So, what can we say about Schurer's argument from silence? Well, as Croy says, I think it's not without force, but is still not decisive. So, okay, it's time to move to Schurer's fifth objection. This is the big one, guys. Number five, quote, A census held under Quirinius could not have taken place in the time of Herod, for Quirinius was never governor of Syria during Herod's lifetime, unquote. So in order to understand this objection, we need to first talk about an ancient Roman historian by the name of Flavius Josephus. He lived from about AD 37 to 100, and he was a military leader in Israel's catastrophic war with Rome, in which he actually went over to the Roman side. And then, under Roman imperial patronage, he wrote an account of the conflict entitled Jewish War. But we care about him because he also wrote a book called Jewish Antiquities, and this covers the period that we're looking at right now. In fact, Josephus mentions a person named Quirinius, the same person that Luke mentions, and just like Luke, Josephus tells us that Quirinius oversaw a census in Judea. But here Josephus doesn't agree with Luke. Josephus places the census, and therefore also the governorship of Quirinius, around the year 6 of the Common Era. Emil Schurer explains the problem as follows, quote, Luke supposes that Jesus was born during the lifetime of Herod. He therefore places the census mentioned by him during Herod's reign. But he also says expressly that it was held hegemonatos tessirius curianu, which can only mean while Quirinius had supreme command over Syria, i.e. when he was governor of Syria. Now, it's known that Quirinius arrived in Syria as governor in AD 6, that's thanks to Josephus that we just talked about, so he can't have been governor in Herod's time, for from about 10 or 9 BC to about 7 or 6 BC, the office was held by Sentius Saturninus, and from about 7 or 6 to 4 BC by Quincilius Verus. But the probable predecessor of Saturninus was Titius, thus during the last five or six years of Herod's reign, there's definitely no room for Quirinius. Unquote. Well, that was a mouthful, but you can actually see a visual depiction of what's going on here. The New Testament historian Raymond Brown has kindly provided this table that you can see here on the slide, showing what we know of the governors of Syria, extending from about 23 BCE to about 7 of the Common Era. And if we keep in mind that Herod died in about 4 BCE, then you can see here in this table that there's just no room for Quirinius to have been a governor of Syria in the last years of Herod's reign. So this seems to be a problem. Inspiring philosophy responds to it by denying that Luke ever claimed that Quirinius was governor during Herod's reign. He appeals to a Concordia University professor, John H. Rhodes, who wrote an article called Josephus Misstated the Census of Quirinius back in 2011. And we can see here Rhodes' position. He writes, quote, Luke uses the participle hegemonontos, which was translated into the English of the King James Bible and later versions as was governor. However, this specificity in identifying the office held by Quirinius is not required by the Greek participle used by Luke." Unquote. So as I indicated a few minutes ago, I can't read Greek myself, so I can't personally confirm or deny what Rhodes has written here about the Greek participle. However, I can confirm that he's not the only one to raise this same objection. Sabine R. Huebner, for instance, writes that, quote, Luke uses the present participle hegemonon, to be a hegemon, to refer to the role of Quirinius, indicating that he might have in fact held the position of procurator. 
Luke certainly doesn't call Quirinius a governor, a term normally rendered in Greek as strategos, unquote. Now, by itself, this doesn't completely solve the problem. It's just too big of a coincidence that Josephus mentions a census under Quirinius in 6 CE, and then Luke also mentions a census under Quirinius, but places it towards the end of Herod's reign, maybe around 6 or 5 BCE. In my opinion, the simplest explanation is that they're talking about the same event, the same census, under the same person, Quirinius, the governor of Syria, but they're just locating this census, and therefore this governorship of Quirinius, at different times. John Rhodes, on the other hand, opts for a considerably more complicated explanation, and it has to do with somebody named Sabinus. Sabine R. Huebner explains who he is, quote, When Herod died in 4 BCE, Varus was governor of Syria, and a certain Sabinus was his procurator, unquote. So why is this relevant? Well, it's because John Rhodes, and by extension, inspiring philosophy, thinks that Sabinus and Quirinius were actually the same person, that Sabinus was just a nickname for Quirinius. Rhodes writes, quote, Perhaps in these sources, Sabinus was not a family name, but an ethnic indicator, that is, the Sabine. Quirinius may have been called Sabinus the Sabine, unquote. So how does Rhodes explain this? Because it's not just about the date per se. It's helpful to remember that Josephus isn't using modern dating in his writings. He doesn't say 6 or 7 CE. What Josephus does is speak of an enrollment by Quirinius, the governor of Syria, when Archelaus, Archelaus was the son of King Herod the Great, uh, when Archelaus was removed from his kingship of Judea, and this scholars have identified as happening in the year 6 or 7 of the Common Era. John Rhodes's response is to say, yeah, well, Josephus was just really confused. He writes, quote, The account which Josephus tells of the census conducted by Quirinius is actually a mistaken duplication of events which occurred much earlier. The census began before Herod the Great's death. This study, that is to say his paper, will offer a new reconstruction of the history based on the sources on which Josephus relied, unquote. So in other words, Rhodes is using something called source criticism to try to get at the unidentified or hitherto unidentified sources of Josephus' account, and he's using these hypothetical sources to argue that Josephus has actually mixed them up somehow. The upshot here is that something's got to give. Either Luke was wrong or Josephus was wrong, and Rhodes is saying, well, it's Josephus. Josephus is wrong. And this is not an entirely new approach. Emil Schur, for instance, cites three scholars, Zahn, Weber, and Lauder, as rejecting the precise statements of Josephus, as he puts it. But scholars have by and large rejected this approach. And we can just take Schur as an example. He writes, quote, Unwarranted is the rejection of the exact date of the census in the 37th year after the Battle of Actium, which implies that the census was necessarily connected with the deposition of Archelaus, and according to Dio, this took place in AD 6, unquote. In other words, the various statements of Josephus, and Dio for that matter, Dio was another ancient historian, these various statements seem to be more interwoven than do the statements of Luke. And Clayton Croy puts it like this, quote, Josephus' statement about the census is far more detailed than Luke's. Josephus briefly describes Quirinius's career, his arrival in Syria, the tasks given to him by the emperor, his subordinate Caponius, and the annexation of Archelaus's territory. Luke simply connects the census to Caesar Augustus and the hegemony of Quirinius, unquote. And so this here is part of what I meant before when I talked about how John Rhodes has to posit significant confusion on the part of Josephus. If we look at John Rhodes' theory, we find that it's not just identifying Sabinus with Quirinius. He also has to identify three other events in Josephus' account, and you can see those described here on the slide, including identifying two or three different Judases that took part in those events. As you can probably imagine, though, Rhodes's theory hasn't always been well received by other scholars. And Clayton Croy writes, quote, Rhodes argues that these three Judases are the same person based on the name and other similarities. The equation of the last two has been seriously proposed by a number of scholars, but also strongly contested. The equation of both of them with the first Judas is far more idiosyncratic. The identity of all three Judases is a dubious proposition that presupposes significant confusion on the part of Josephus." Unquote. 
The New Testament scholar Jonathan Bernier isn't much kinder. He writes of John Rhodes' theory that it's guilty of, quote, relying too strongly on source-critical speculation and a questionable interpretation of the earlier Judas's patrimonic, unquote. I think Croy sums it up rather nicely when he writes that, quote, Rhodes relies too heavily on speculative source criticism. His basic hypothesis of Josephus's misdating is itself built upon further hypotheses. It is, therefore, second-order speculation and unconvincing, unquote. So that about sums it up for Schurer's five objections, and then Inspiring Philosophy's responses to those objections, and then my responses to Inspiring Philosophy's responses. And what'd you guys think? Were Schurer's objections any good? I myself, at the beginning, said that I thought the fifth objection was the big one. I do also think that the second objection about how Joseph wouldn't have had to go to his ancestral homeland, I think that is a pretty forceful objection as well, and I don't find the idea that, well, maybe Joseph owned property in Bethlehem, uh, who knows, eh, that doesn't seem very convincing to me. In doing the research for this video, though, I did become convinced that many of these objections are often overstated. I thought Schur was just far too ambitious in trying to tear down Luke's account, and I don't think that Luke's account is all that unrealistic. I liked how Sabine R. Huebner put it. She wrote that, quote, I'm not arguing here that Luke's report of the journey made by Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem corresponds to historical facts, only that it is, if it is fictional, at least a story that could be true, since the author of the Gospel of Luke knows and respects the historical circumstances of the time in which he places the birth of Jesus. His depiction of the census can be seen as thoroughly realistic." Unquote. Now, to say that Luke's account is realistic isn't to say that he didn't make even serious mistakes. In my opinion, it's pretty obvious that Luke has probably at least misdated the census of Quirinius and the governorship of Quirinius. But it's probably also worth noting that my opinion is colored by my other opinions about Luke as a historian. In doing the research for this video, I came across a comment by the evangelical biblical scholar Mark L. Strauss, and I disagree with evangelicals about a lot of things, but this seemed on point, so I'm going to read it to you guys. Quote, While there are significant problems related to the census, there is not enough evidence either to refute or confirm Luke's claim. In disputed cases like this, one's assessment of Luke's overall reliability as a historian will likely be the deciding factor." Unquote. And I think Strauss was right. It is the deciding factor. I don't think Luke was a competent historian, and so that definitely colors my opinion here. But fortunately for you guys, you all have your own opinions. I mean, obviously. Hopefully you did enjoy hearing about my opinion, though. Uh, but anyway, I, I hope it was fun for you guys. It's definitely fun for me. As I said at the beginning, I am so in the Christmas spirit right now, so this was really cool. But yeah, uh, that's all for now, guys. Until next time.